The Book of Lamentations, um, I kind of feel like lamentation is a uh, not a common word, and so it tends to feel kind of like a churchy word, or maybe even like a, a Bible word. Um, but lamentation just really means wailing, crying out, um, uh, weeping, and and not the kind where um, I don't know. You're sitting there and you see some precious scene and your heart is kind of moved and then, you know, one holy tear kind of slides from the side of your cheek. Not that kind of weeping, uh, but the kind that's embarrassing. The kind that you only do when you're really alone and nobody else is around and, um, and you got snot coming out of your nose and, 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 you know, drool coming out of your mouth and, and your eyes are just flowing and flowing and you lose control of your body and, and you're just sobbing. That's what the book of Lamentations is about. And, uh, I've been trying over the last couple of weeks to connect our congregation, to connect my own heart, your heart, to God's heart, which gets broken. And it's difficult for us because we have Jesus and we have the Holy Spirit and we have so much hope that sometimes we tend to like skip the, over the top of brutal suffering. If you've ever thought to yourself, I'm in no condition to go to church. You know, like I'm, I'm, I'm too, I'm too out of it. I'm too sad. I'm too, I could not present myself in public like this. That just goes to show you um, how afraid our culture is of people who are deeply grieving. And we talked a lot about that this last week. But one of the reasons that deep grief and expressing deep grief and giving permission for it, especially in the context of hope, is it is in grief and suffering and misery that God is able to adjust our expectations. And we grow up as kids, and we we have this picture of who God is. And I've become convinced that one of the reasons why so many young people, 18 to 25, 28 years old, so many of them leave church is because God doesn't turn out to be sort of the Sunday school version that they learned or they thought they learned. Don't we take all of the bad stuff out of the children's stories? Right? In Noah's flood, we don't teach our children about how many trillions of people died. We don't focus on that. We focus on the ark. We focus on listening to God. We focus on all the animals. Because, you know, that would have been fun. If you're a little kid and you get to, you know, bring all the animals onto a boat with you and have a party while, and we teach about the victory of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as, as they were thrown into the fiery furnace, which is an incredibly brutal act to burn somebody alive, but that's what was happening. And yes, that's a story of rescue, but there were many, many, many stories of people who didn't get rescued. It's brutal. And by shying away from the brutal reality of our cold world, I think young people make some mistakes. Maybe they walk away from God a little bit. They experience how brutal the world is and how awful um, you can feel when you get into a relationship that turns out awful when you dabble in substances that you shouldn't and it really and truly wrecks your life. And these consequences, this, this deep agony, it just doesn't seem to be a part of like what we learned in church. So much so that I think maybe 80% of us this morning are going to have difficulty with my first point. Chapter 3, verse 1, reads like this. I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. Who is the he? It's God. 
The author of Lamentations is crying, he's wailing, he's writing out this, this beautiful but sad poetry about what the experience is like. And he says, I am the man who has seen affliction under the rod of his wrath. He has driven and brought me into darkness without any light. Surely against me he turns his hand again and again the whole day long. He has made my flesh and my skin waste away. He has broken my bones. He has besieged and enveloped me with bitterness and tribulation. He has made me dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. He has walled me about so that I cannot escape. He has made my chains heavy. Though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has blocked my ways with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. He is a bear lying in wait for me, a lion in hiding. He turned aside my steps and tore me to pieces. He has made me desolate. He has bent his bow and set me as a target for his arrow. He drove into my kidneys and you might have a different version that says heart. They believed that the kidneys were the sort of the seat of emotion. So in modern English, it would be he drove it into my metaphorical heart. He stabbed me in the heart. He drove into my heart the arrows of his quiver. I have become the laughing stock of all peoples, the object of their taunts all day long. He has filled me with bitterness. He has sated me with wormwood. Does anybody know what wormwood is? Absinthe. Um, it's a weed. It's actually uh, pretty common. And they soak this green leaf in alcohol, and it pulls out these neurotoxins. And you drink it. It's incredibly bitter, but it sort of like doubles up the alcoholic effect. You don't just get drunk. You go kind of crazy. It's really bad for you. <laughs> it's really bad for you. But uh, in France, I think it was in the... Uh, 1800s, early 1900s, when there was an alcohol shortage, the common people began to drink absinthe, wormwood, as a way to ease their troubles. Medicinally, it was given to pregnant woman, women during birth to ease their pain. And there was a day when people who suffered from rheumatic fever were given wormwood as the only thing to help. It makes you go a little daft, a little crazy, but it numbs you. The picture is God is holding the guy lamenting and he's pouring into his mouth bitterness, causing him to be full of wormwood, absinthe. He has made my teeth grind on gravel and made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. So I say my endurance has perished, so has my hope from the Lord. I think our first instinct is to be like, well, that's the way you feel. Right? It's okay to write your feelings that way. Just get them out. Get those bad feelings out so that you can return to the good feelings. Like pour out that poison that's in you. This poison that's accusing God. But actually... The writer is not accusing God. He's agreeing that God indeed is doing this. He is recognizing the sovereignty of God. This is so hard for us. It's hard for us to admit God is doing this to me. My business is failing. I have, I have no ability to get my business to grow. I have no ability to make my boss like me. I'm going to get fired. God is doing this to me. I'm sick and I can't make myself better. My children are sick and I can't help them. We're dealing with homelessness in our family, drug addiction in our family. We pray and we pray. And we can't quite get to the place where we can say, God is doing this. Can I just sell you on the advantage of agreeing with the author of Lamentations? Because if God isn't sovereign, if God isn't doing this, 
we get two awful things. One is our flat and wrong picture of who God really is doesn't change. I get to have the happy, clappy Jesus. It never, the Lord of the universe, the thundering God of the universe, the great I am, I never get to experience him. I have a very flat picture of him. I never, never have to humble myself before him. God, I know you don't want this. God, I know you're not doing this. Someone else is doing this. Let's you and me team up, happy clappy Jesus, and we'll pray the gray away. But that's not how it works. We can say, God is doing this. And he gives us a picture that's not just like, I'm going through sad things and God is sovereign. He's saying, God's a bear lying in wait. I'm going along a path that God has made crooked. It's dark. I'm feeling my way along. There's stones in my path, so I can't even stay on the crooked path. I'm trying to get around the stones, and there's a bear hiding there, and he's slashing me and tearing me to pieces. I'm trying to crawl away from him, and there's a lion, and the lion is God, and God's shredding my face. He's tearing my back all day long, and then there's people that God brings along to to, che to cheer at, at, at my falling down, to taunt me. And when I'm screaming, he's pouring wormwood in my mouth. That's awful. But it, this guy, this guy is teaching us something about wailing, grief, and lamentation. And that is, I am not in control here, God. I am not in control. And I will not be too proud. I am being shredded. I am being torn apart. I am sipping on wormwood, guzzling it down. And it's awful. And you're the one who's doing it. You're the one who's in charge of it. Because God is so sovereign, this lamentation is not accusing God of doing wrong. It's just saying, God, you're really in charge, and this really sucks. This is not just some, some time out that I'm going through. This is brutal. This is brutal. You're the one in charge of it, and I hate it. I don't want it. In the 1950s, um, a guy named Norman Vincent Peale wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking. He was a preacher, and he got invited into churches all around the nation during this era of positivity and good feelings. But we here have to leave our cultural instinct to positive think our way through grief. That's not what the Bible is teaching us to do. Actually, we must accept that God is in control of everything. Here's what I want you to know. We're going to cover a lot. I don't want you to get lost. I want you to know this. The way through heartache is waiting on God. That's the way through. You can rebuke heartache all you want. You can say it doesn't exist. You can close your eyes and pretend it doesn't hurt. But the way through heartache is waiting, a season of waiting, a season of advent. It's waiting on God. And if you go out of here and you only do one thing, is in your grief, I, I would like you to be able to grow in God's spirit by waiting well. We don't, I think we grow less as Christians. We become less mature in times where our circumstances agree with everything that we expect and desire. And we have like maybe one or two little things that are a little out of whack. That we're like, God could use your help on this one, this one too. But when everything's out of whack, when your heart is broken, we can grow incredibly. 
We could grow incredibly because it's we're not the center of the universe. Our expectations are not the center of the universe. If the beginning of Lamentations chapter 3 can tell us anything, it's that this guy who's in grief has given up control. He knows he's not in charge. God, this is all you. God is sovereign. And that means he is in control of everything that's outside of your control. And theologically, we could also argue that God can also take control of what we are in control of. So that's how out of control we can be. But we still get the ability to make decisions. We, we are always given the ability to make, make at least one decision in every avenue of our life. And that is, Will I wait on God or will I not? Will I look to God or will I not? Will I serve God or will I not? It's God or something else in every decision in our life. And Lamentations chapter 3, 1 through 18 is saying, I'm still waiting on God. He's the one who's doing all of this, but I'm still choosing God. How could he do that? How can this guy who is convinced that God is shredding him to pieces and pouring absinthe down his throat, shutting out his prayers and torturing him day and night, how could he be so full of faith to wait on the Lord? Read with me in verse 19. Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. Who's he telling to remember? There's an instruction here, remember. But it's not addressed. He's, I think that he's, this is like um, an open command. He's telling it to himself. He's telling it to future readers. He's telling it to his community. He's telling it to God. He's saying, we all need to remember this moment of deep grief. We need to, uh, like the ancient people did, pile up stones in remembrance of the dark times. That's hard for us. It's very hard for us to leave a pit in the ground where the World Trade Center once was. It's hard for us to do that. But he's saying, remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. The gall. My soul is continual. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. This is the state of the soul in grief. Continue, it can't stop thinking about the disaster. It can't stop living in the sadness. It can't stop and it is bowed down. It is not upright. The soul is not upright. It is not triumphant. It does not have its hand raised in victory, but the soul is bent down. But this he caused to his mind, and therefore I have hope. And I don't think that it is a mistake that he calls it first to his mind, to his reason. Because I think that sometimes our emotions, our heart, our relationship with God can get so out of whack with, with how we're feeling that this guy is saying, but I put something in my mind. This is what I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Does this sound like almost a completely different guy to you? It does to me. When I began reading the book of Lamentations, I wanted to just snip out of my Bible the other stuff and just have this in here. And I wanted to say this is the heart of the text, but it's not the heart of the text. It's the, it's the center point. It's the balancing point of the text, but it's not the heart. The heart is full of grief. The heart is full of, of deep sadness. But the mind is full of the thoughts of the steadfast love of the Lord. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. And this can be difficult to believe. Sometimes we feel like, no, God has utterly rejected me. God doesn't care about me anymore. 
The whole ship is going down. The plane is flaming. The engines are out. It's time to bail out. We're all going to die. God's forgotten us. But this man is so full of faith that at the depth of his wailing, of his grief, he thinks to himself, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. This is someone who has wrapped their mind around who God really is, the thundering God of the universe, not one to be trifled with, and yet this God, this omnipotent being who can do whatever he wants, he's full of steadfast love. He loves mercy. His mercies never come to an end. Every time we're in a dark night, we have to remember that with the sun coming up in the morning, there are new mercies. And we can explore our whole day to find those mercies until it grows dark again and we can look forward to the sun coming up. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Not fickle is your faithfulness. Not sometimes is your faithfulness. But great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. You see how he started with the mind? To think about the steadfast love, the mercy of God. And then his soul is able to say, The Lord is my portion, therefore I will hope in him. This is so incredibly important because we can learn here that in our deepest griefs there is no limit on the portion allowed to you of God's Spirit. There is nothing so disastrous in your life that you cannot consume as much of the Holy Spirit as you need and more. And when we do that, when the Lord is our portion, a little candle gets lit and it's called hope. The reason he is able to have hope while the bear is tearing him to shreds while he's guzzling down absinthe and, 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 and screaming in pain, the reason why there is a little flicker of hope inside of him is not because he can see some way out, but because the Lord is his portion. And because God is good, there is always hope. So here is how the poet here teaches us to wait, to wait well. We focus on God's character. We don't focus on the circumstances. We lament the circumstances. We, we wail the circumstances, but it's not what we're eating. It's not what we're putting into us. We're putting into us the Spirit of God. And what we're waiting for is not our circumstances to change, but we're waiting on Him. Furthermore, we're to wait quietly. Because time is on our side. If God is your portion, if you are choosing God, if you're waiting on God, then you will not be put to shame. Verse 25, the Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. See the connect. This is why he says it's it's better for you to be a young man, drenched in grief. It's better that way because time's on your side. Because you've got a lot of mornings ahead of you, where the sun comes up. You have a lot of God's faithfulness ahead of you. It's better. It's good for a man to bear that yoke in his youth rather than in his old age. So verse. 28, let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. He's saying that that we shouldn't be melodramatic. Remember, the whole point of Lamentations is putting our focus on God. Recognizing the sovereignty of God. Recognizing that we are not in control and this universe is not all about us. That's what suffering and grief is good for. We are totally convinced this universe doesn't revolve around me. 
It convinces us, us of that. And because we become truly convinced, deep in our heart, not just paying lip service, but while everything is going good in our lives, it actually kind of feels like the universe is revolving around me. Like my good is the most important thing for God. And by my good, I mean things go the way I want them. So he's saying, if they're not going the way you want, don't be melodramatic about it. Don't put all of the attention in public on yourself. Oh, woe is me. Oh, God's against me, and I'm this, I'm that. He's saying, no, 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 put your mouth in the dust. Humble yourself. Realize this isn't about you. This is about God. There may yet be hope if you really humble yourself. And if you lay down your rights. Look at verse 30. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes. Let him be filled with insults. I think the most basic God-given right to all mankind is the right to self-defense. Someone comes at you with a knife or a gun, you can defend yourself. You know, There's no jury in the world, no judge in the world in any culture. It's going to be like, well, you should have just let him beat you up. Why did you do that? You should have just let him take all of your stuff and, and burn down your house in every culture. We are allowed to defend ourselves. But not this man who's deep in grief. He's saying, no, no, I'll lay down all of my rights. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes. Let him be filled with insults. So, point number one, if there is a point number one, is that in order to wait well, we have to wait with our focus on God's character. And if there's a point number two, it would be that the character of God is that God loves compassion and justice. God loves compassion and justice. This is why it's okay to lay down your rights. This is why it's okay to get trampled on. Because you might not be able to self-rescue, you might not be able to secure your own future. You might not be able to do what God can do and control all things and make things what you want. But the Lord cannot cast his people off forever. Those who choose God, God will do good to them. Verse 31, the Lord will not cast off forever. But though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. God doesn't like to see his people suffering, even when he's the one doing it. When God is the one afflicting his children, the, the best possible response is to weep and to wail and to examine your ways and to look to him and to say, God, you are doing this. You are in control and I will humble myself. I will sit quietly. I will wait on you. You are the focus of my life. You are the focus of the universe. And what is going to happen is that eventually, someday, the sun's going to come up, God's going to look at his suffering child and say, no more! No more. Not one ounce more. I can't take it anymore. I love him too much. Though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love. He does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. To crush underfoot all the prisoners of the earth? To deny a man justice in the presence of the Most High? To subvert a man in his lawsuit? The Lord does not approve. Now, the author of Lamentations is doing a quick read through Deuteronomy, and he's going, I know the character of God. He doesn't like these things. He doesn't like prisoners being crushed underfoot. He doesn't like even strangers and foreigners being denied justice. He doesn't like any man, any widow, to be subverted in their lawsuit. No, God, God loves justice. He loves compassion. God loves compassion and justice. Everything that happens, good and bad, is because God commands it. Read in chapter, uh, verse 37 with me. 
He who has spoken and it came to, who has spoken and it came to pass? Unless the Lord has commanded it. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? Why should a living man complain? A man about the punishment of his sins. Now this is a key. This is a key. Because God loves compassion and God loves justice, when we are deep in our grief, if we humble ourselves, there will be one important question that we will ask ourselves. Have I offended God? We'll examine our ways and we'll say, am I reflecting God's character in this world? Is this a punishment because of my sins? And this can be hard because a lot of times we just, I didn't earn this. And you might not have earned it. But the person who is in lament, who is in grief, always considers, I could be wrong here. I could be wrong. The person who will not consider that, in the end, isn't really choosing God, are they? So we have to examine ourselves. Verse 40. Let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. If there's some way that that, that we're not following God, then we have to return. And verse 41 tells us how. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Now, the ancient rabbinic commentary on this, I just... Love it. Um, because it talks about baptism. The, the complete, um, submersion in water to come up and become clean. Now, he wasn't talking about baptism as you and I know it, but nevertheless, it's still really rich. And he says, for one to repent in his heart, but not with his hands. It is like being baptized while holding a snake. You get that picture? You're being baptized, but you're still clinging on to the snake? What good is the baptism then? If you come up out of the water and you're still holding on to the snake. No, your heart and your hands. That means not just what you intend to do, what you want to do, but actually what you do. And this can be a great sign that we are still selfish in that we want to do the right thing, but we can't. We want to follow God, but we can't. Now that is something that only the Spirit of God and sometimes a great amount of suffering can fix. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to the God of heaven. We have transgressed and rebelled, and you have not forgiven. Let's take one last point one last chunk of scripture and this would be my third point if I have a third point in the universe like God's universe all of created order there are good guys and there are bad guys you might not have known this there are There are good guys, there are bad guys. And good guys look a certain way. And bad guys look a certain way. When we're deep in lamentation and suffering, when we are truly having our hearts broken, because God's heart is broken, yes, we will put our minds on who God is. Yes, we will hope in God and examine our own ways and return to the Lord fully and completely if there's anything that's out of order. But we will also be very afraid of God's ultimate justice. Verse 43, You have wrapped yourself with anger and pursued us, killing without pity. You have wrapped yourself with a cloud so that no prayer can pass through. You have made us scum and garbage among the peoples. All our enemies open their mouths against us. Panic and pitfall have come upon us. Devastation and destruction. My eyes flow with rivers of tears because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. My eyes will flow without ceasing, without respite, until the Lord from heaven looks down and sees. My eyes cause me grief at the fate 
of all my daughters of my city. I have been hunted like a bird by those who were my enemies without cause, like David. They have flung me alive into the pit and cast stones on me, like Joseph, like Daniel. The water closed over my head, like Jonah. I said, I am lost. I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit, which all the good guys do. I called on your name, O Lord, from the depths of the pit. You heard my plea. Do not close your ear to my cry for help. You came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. Like Gideon. Like Mary. Like Zechariah, you came near when I called on you. You said, do not fear. Let this be an earmark of a good guy who's going through an incredibly hard time. He will not be afraid. He might be destroyed. He might be weeping. He might be crying out. He might lose perspective every now and again. But he won't be afraid because he's crying out to God. He knows that God will answer. And whenever God draws near, he says, do not fear. Verse 58, you have taken up my cause, O Lord. You have redeemed my life. You have seen the wrong done to me, O Lord. Judge my cause. You have seen all their vengeance, all their plots against me. You see how... He's saying, God, you're, I'm on your side. I'm waiting on you. I've examined my ways. I'm a good guy. You've drawn near. You're redeeming me and you will judge. You will judge me. And in the end, the believer, the one who waits for God, judgment is rescue. Judgment is rescue. You see, enemies, they persecute. They rejoice in suffering. But the good guys, they weep. They weep because they know that God sees it. They're not weeping to get the persecutor to stop. They're weeping because they know God sees it and that God someday, sometime, will come down and intervene. Just like David, just like Joseph, just like Daniel, just like Jonah, just like Gideon, just like Samson, just like Jesus. God will come down. Verse 61. You have heard their taunts, O Lord, all their plots against me. The lips and thoughts of my assailants are against me all the day long. Behold, they're sitting and they're rising I am the object of their taunts. Bad guys pay attention to people. Good guys pay attention to God. Specifically, bad guys are always focused on who's beneath them, laughing at them, and who's above them so they can pull them down. Verse 64, You will repay them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. You will give them dullness of heart. Your curse will be on them. You will pursue them in anger and destroy them from under your heavens, O Lord. You see, the person who is in lamentation, the person who is waiting in a season of Advent, knows that God hears everything, knows that God sees everything, and that judgment and rescue are at hand. They're coming. No matter how long the season may be, God's arrival, God's advent, God's incarnation, it's always imminent. And so we don't have to fear. We can wait well. Wait with our focus on God's character. Wait knowing that God loves compassion and justice. Examining our ways. Growing in our relationship with our hearts and our hands. Choosing to differentiate ourselves from the people who are against God, who persecute and rejoice in suffering, and instead choose to weep.
some of us are in uh, seasons of suffering. Some of us have our hearts broken for the awful things that are happening that we're not in control of. Some of us are weeping for our own rebellion, our own bad decisions. But the answer is universal. It's the same. We wait on God. We draw near to God because he loves us. We restore our faith in him, our life in him, so that we're not afraid of judgment. We're ready for rescue. Let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, you are so, so good. Your steadfast love endures forever. Great is your faithfulness, O God. Help us to examine our ways. Help us to put our faith in you. Help us to wait on you. Help us to grow when it feels like we're being destroyed. Be our portion, Lord. Fill us with your spirit. Cause us to be agents who, who bring your goodwill, who bring your healing, even if it is through seasons of weeping. And we, we are waiting, God, we are waiting for you. God, I am waiting for you. We are waiting for your rescue. We are waiting for you to draw near. Hear us when we cry to you, Lord. Hear the cry of your people. Draw near and tell us not to be afraid. We pray this in your holy name. Amen.